nacen de un huevo. No llevan arco y flecha, ni canasta. Ocupan un espacio entre medio. No glorifican la maternidad ni la guerra. Caen como la fruta de un árbol. Hi, thank you so much, Beatrice, for being with us and for sharing the films this evening. And thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, so as I, as I mentioned before, uh, you just came from San Juan for the first time. 
But, and of course, you know, the, the hurricane just kind of caused this complete fissure in time, which has kind of changed everything, the kind of like the, the feel of everything, the look of everything. When we were watching um, the films in the test screening, you know, it's like the first time you've seen them again and these images now feel really different. Um, but maybe we can start by going before and um, talking, I'd love to hear a little bit about the context of the disused military base um, that these last two films were, were shot at. And of course, there's actually a third as well. They're kind of like three films um, from this particular place. The third one we're actually going to show in the final, um, the final event of the series, which is going to be in April um, next year, because it's going to cross two semesters. Um, could you talk a little bit about that particular place to start with? Yeah, so um, both of those were shot in uh, what used to be a U.S. Navy base in Ceiba on the eastern coast of Puerto Rico. Actually, the Navy base comprises both that part, uh, that piece of land, and also Vieques, which is an island off of Puerto Rico that was used uh, by the Navy to practice bomb for about 60 years. And uh, then there was a really um, uh, wide civil disobedience movement led by Viequenses in the uh, between 2000 and 2003, um, the Navy left those bases. And so this, uh, this land is now on its way to become something else. This is, uh, this is the part that it's now, it's now becoming yet another thing because of the hurricane. But um, in, the, in a tropical environment, um, for example, the... Uh, secondary forest will be uh, virtually indistinguishable from a primary forest uh, in something like 60 years. So already um, 13 years after the base uh, was uh, closed, there was a, a forest uh, on its way, the place was on its way to becoming a forest. And I was trying to use... Uh, to experiment with the camera in order to be able to recognize this other event that was happening in these places that is sometimes hard to recognize when uh, you are um, only, for example, paying attention to the image that is produced when you use the camera plane rationally. No? So if you stand in this um, uh, dock that takes about 10 minutes to walk, um, and you, you look through the camera, the image that the dock creates is one of really strong diagonals. And you are, uh, in many ways, reproducing the footprint that the military has left there. And uh, I kept trying to look in different ways. And really, uh, the moment where I saw the fishermen, and the way that they were using this dock, which was um, by transforming the scale at which they were thinking, they were making it again into a shore. So I started working very literally with uh, how to fold and collapse that plane of the camera so that it could, uh, I could create an image that did not reproduce this military footprint so that I could see differently, use it differently, like they were using it differently. Um, and the uh, uh, post-military cinema uh, was shot in the cinema of the base. And again, using the theater itself uh, in order to be able to see this new event taking place. I mean, what's so striking to me about all of these images is that you're sort of in some ways coming at it from like a, a documentary position in a way, but you're really, um, your approach is, is so sort of proto-cinematic. It's like really reaching towards all of these different materials, like mirrors, like this prismatic quality, the quality of how, how light literally hits each surface and kind of transforms it into the cinematic without the screen, you know. I mean, of course, you do also represent the screen in the post-military cinema bit with the beautiful light play, um, which has also, you know, become silent at one point. But could you talk um, a little bit about your, about how you um, kind of situate your work, I suppose, in kind of like a, 
uh, a context of like a, a long history of cinema in relation to also then shining a lens on, on these kind of ab abandoned and um, misused previously by the military and occupation forces spaces? I think, I mean, I think that for me, the uh, using, um, I, I, can't, I can't use the forms of cinema that I have inherited as is because they've got, uh, I mean, they're in my mind, they're in my archive. You can't help but see, uh, sort of recognize, same as we were talking today, sort of recognize an image when you see it again. Um, we were speaking about the images coming out of Puerto Rico right now, uh, which are, um, I mean, uh, uh, very recognizable images of a moment of catastrophe, you know, um, and how those, those images, like we already know what, what they are. We know what tradition of uh, image making they come from. And what I don't know, uh, I know that I have to do, which is to uh, find other forms that can uh, respond to other moments and maybe even uh, propose other ways of thinking. I mean, I, do, I, I think that I think about making films as a process of thinking. Um, thinking with the images. Um, and so a lot of the time when I am making something, I, I'm not following a set idea that I have in my mind, but I'm rather uh, trying to use the materials in order to think with the place. Uh, yeah. But that's sort of um, inscribed on all of these images is like, you know, the sensory is kind of really present. It's not just about like, you know, the flat surface of the image, it's also the sound, it's, the, you know, the, the kind of prismatic quality and, and all of that side of things. And um, I wonder if you could talk, we've been talking a lot, of course, uh, since you've been here about um, what you're grappling with now in terms of your thinking of, of also kind of resisting a nostalgia um, for for image making, and then also now when you look at these, like a nostalgia for the place when when it was there, and you don't know what it looks like now. Um, and uh, maybe it's a little too early, but the 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 things that the way that you're thinking is going at the moment is this kind of what you described as like what's the gap between or what's the difference between um, a wreck or a wreckage and um, a ruin? Could you talk a little bit about? about that. Yeah. Well, I've been thinking a lot about how the idea of a ruin or like ruinous thinking um, uh, is uh, filters a lot of the ways of, of how we see, for example, uh, the, the military footprint or I'm not, I'm not interested in thinking about a ruin. I'm not interested in this way of thinking which you see half of the Colosseum and then, and you see its glorious past self. I'm not, uh, I don't want to reproduce an image that uh, sort of recreates that idea. Um, so, and, and it's interesting that over the past couple of months, nobody, even though it looks like uh, an atomic bomb has gone off uh, on the island, nobody has said the word ruin. Nobody uh, is thinking about it as a ruin, but there is a lot of talk about escombros and rubble and wrecks. Um, and, and, I'm trying to think, like, what, what then is uh, thinking about it as a wreck? What, uh, is, there an, is there an interesting way of thinking about uh, this moment in which we are um, unmoored no? um, from a place that constructs us as subjects? Um, is there a way of thinking uh, about it as a wreck that allows us not to think nostalgically, not to think about recreating a past, uh, but to, yeah, I mean, I think that salvage something and construct different ways of living as well. I'm, I don't think I have an answer. I, do, I know, though, that um, there is a difference between thinking of something as a ruin or as, uh, or as rubble. Another way you've been describing um, it is a kind of disorganization as well. Yeah, Things like being... going to, you know, you're used to seeing a coast or a beach a certain way. Uh, you have a, a path to go through it that has been made over decades and the hurricane comes through and uh, disorganizes this path for us, really. It doesn't disorganize it for itself. It has just, there, there are certain places actually that you see that uh, 
the sea is taking over something that we had slowly been carving out for ourselves and very quickly. So now sand is about a mile inland where it didn't used to be. Um, so it's a, a new, a kind of reorganization that uh, makes everybody disoriented. Um, and there's many things that you don't even realize are part of your thinking uh, in space. Uh, like your... Uh, you know that you, well, you know in your body that the place where you turn left in order to go home, you don't even need to see the signage because you, there used to be a large tree there that creates shade and the moment that you start feeling the shade, you know that you have to be moving towards the left and there's no tree there anymore so you pass it by without even realizing that you are disoriented. No? And this happens all the time now because there's many uh, markers that have been destroyed, uh, I was uh, telling Victoria that I was telling somebody, I was telling them directions, oh, where we have to turn at this corner where the house used to be. Um, and of course, this is, uh, if we're all going to remember where the tree used to be and where the house used to be for the next 10 years in order to be able to orient ourselves, it's going to be a very complicated, uh, very complicated time. It's hard not to read in the in the from the first film that had had killed everyone. Um, all of the it's almost like taking cues from that which are now so present in your life now. You know, to to see the 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 spell to like cast out being that of a hurricane, like quite literally, or an atomic bomb. But then at the same time, um, your use of, um, of of filming the performer with you know like a a headlamp as well mm -hmm. a single <laughs> lamp, which has now become the most uh, yeah. coveted of your possessions. <laughs> yes. um, it's kind of, you know, it's, it, it's, it's problematic, but also so easy to kind of like, you know, pick up these cues of like the, you know, the, 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 um, the kind of decom decomposed image in itself just in this last one and, and all of these kind of reference points uh -huh. to vegetation kind of encroaching and how it's been taken away. Yeah, there's a lot of synchronicity in the, um, in the work. I mean, if you... Like if you read it backwards, no, in time, uh, first hurricane and then film, th things start making sense in a very strange way. Um, yeah. Could you just say a few words actually about that first film as well and about the performer in particular? Mm -hmm. Well, um, her name is Michelle Nono and she's a performer, but also, I mean, she's one of those people that is at times a performer, at times a kind of informal educator in her community. She lives in a place called uh, Barrio San Antón in Carolina, and she, out of her house and her garden, uh, does a lot of uh, projects that have to do with medicinal plants and it's alternative ways of thinking with people in her community. And so we're friends and we've collaborated in other projects. And so this is a, a, a film that it's made, like the script is made for her, really. And of, of course, the question that we've, everyone's been asking you as well when, you, you know, have you been picking up your camera again since the, yeah. the hurricane? And it seems, you know, it's interesting when you say your approach where you're, where you're just, um, you've just started filming again, but really you're just filming, you're not sure where it's going to go, right. um, uh, where these images are going to happen, but you know it's important to film them. But the one thing that's striking is that in some ways your approach hasn't changed at all. You know, you said you're talk talking about, um, you know, filming uh, how certain particular hallucinogenic plants are like prop propping up right by the ocean where they should never be before and, and this sort of thing. And in, in the same way, it's exactly the same approach as before. Could you talk a little bit about that kind of peculiarity of yeah. seeing things in the wrong places? Um, yeah, <laughs> there's, yeah, everything's in the wrong place now, you know, like, you know, things, there's, there's a very iconic image that you keep seeing all the time after the hurricane, which is the zinc, uh, a piece of zinc roofing wrapped around the tree. But by now it's everywhere, so it's like, it's like a cliche image of the... Um, so, but it's the classic, like, the, you know, a thing where it should not be. Everything is where it should not be. Um, and so much that you can't even think of putting things back in order. Everything is disorder, so it's a kind of new order. Um, I have, yeah, I've been, uh, I've been shooting just a bit over the 
last two weeks, the first few weeks, there was no electricity, so no way to charge your batteries and no gasoline. So you didn't want to be running your car in order to charge it either. Um, but uh, And I was using a bit of film I had on a Bolex, on a wind-up Bolex, uh, which was nice. I haven't developed that yet. But I think that it, basically I'm using the process of uh, filmmaking and looking through a camera as a way of, of understanding what is happening. Because I'm not, like, I, I don't think that I understand it properly yet. So all, all I can do is um, pay attention and make sure that I'm recording it. Um, I mean, I think that also, uh, yeah, I, I hope that it will reveal itself, you know. Well, and the synchronicity that you're talking about too, um, Beatrice relayed an amazing story about going to see Blade Runner. <laughs> Maybe you should re recount this story. Yeah, yeah, well, I went to see Blade Runner in a movie theater when the theaters had, like just a few theaters had opened and they were running on generators. Um, so, and there was some place, I can't remember, I think it was in Bayamón that we went to. It was running on a generator, so not very good AC. The screen was, uh, had been raped, um, but we were all dying to see a movie. And we knew that it was um, very, that we knew that it was going to be very apocalyptic and that it was, in a way, it was going to feel very different for us to be watching this film um, in this place. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was an interesting experience, yes, yeah. to be watching. Um, they, got, they got all the, that I think that most dystopian sci-fi, what it gets right, and that's coming for us, is uh, all those ads. Uh, like, you, you wouldn't think that you could be sold your misery back to you or your, but very quickly, very efficiently, those images are, you know, uh, toothpaste that you only need two ounces of water to wash your teeth with. Uh, um, Campbell's soup cans, very important. Uh, it, there's, it's very, the publicity, uh, the, those kinds of images, um, I think that, yeah, Children of Men got right in its, um, in its ads on the film. Yeah. On that note, um, should we have some questions? Um, thank you so much for, um for coming for such wonderful thoughts about your work. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, and I don't have any sort of specific way I'm thinking about it, I was wondering if you could talk generally about the role of silence mm -hmm. in, in these, these films, you know, in the way that, that sound cuts out rather quickly and kind of surprisingly. I was wondering if you had mm -hmm. you know, what you could say about that. I think, like, mostly I'm, I like seeing the seams in things, um, and I like uh, seeing uh, how something is constructed um, and the moments in which the sound cuts out for me are a, a kind of a moment to which, in which you can see the image alone and see what the image does when you have the sound on it. You know, just to sort of test your thinking about images as you're watching the film. I mean, I, I enjoy it when I'm watching, uh, when I'm watching work. Uh, and, I, and I don't know if you do it as well, but, you know, turn sound off just to know what an image does without the sound and, you know, test things in this way. Um, but I'm interested in that kind of thinking. And then this last film, Otros Usos, has a really faint, faint sound. It's almost not there. I recorded it in a, a very close to where I shot it, um, in a warehouse that, is an, that creates an echo a faraway echo of what's happening at the dock. So I wanted to retain this idea of the displaced sound um, uh, within, within the film. Um, and so there, it's, it's not silent, but uh, I'm trying to retain the almost silence. Um, when you were talking about ruins and apocalyptic images, I couldn't um, not think about Robert Smithson's text, Ruins in the Verse. Do, mm -hmm. do you know 
I, no. I haven't read it in a few years. Maybe I haven't even <laughs> fact checked, but um, it's when it, he wrote it in the seventies, and he's driving in the Passaic in New Jersey, and mm -hmm. he's seeing this sort of phenomena of um, of these of this like model housing being built in Jersey that he sees as this sort of eyesore and in the world and sort of this invasion of man to mm -hmm. you know build this horrible architecture that's sort of ruining the environment uh -huh. in Jersey as, as it stands and um, and what's interesting I think that the text is sort of this journey of seeing how these things will crumble and how nature will sort of create new order like mm -hmm. it, it'll sort of bring back the certain order that's been put out of place and um, and I think about your images and I think about how um, there is a sort of positive or positivism like about is something as scary as natural phenomena and something as awful and devastating but yet there is a certain um, way that images <coughs> are created then that are kind of reverse <laughs> some of the terrible things that we have done as people or something, you know, I don't know if that's a stretch, but um, it, it made me make that connection. Yeah, I, I, I'm not familiar with that text of his, but I think he must have written uh, a lot of texts that dealt with the same ideas. Cause the, there's other text, texts on Passaic as well. But yeah, um, yeah. I think that. I mean, I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it's positive thinking. Um, I think I, I mostly just think of it as uh, paying attention, you know, and trying to recognize things that our our minds and ways of seeing are not attuned to yet that we can't quite sense, um, uh, and using almost as many obstacles to myself, to my own way of thinking, in order to see things that I'm not, uh, I haven't been, uh, that my mind isn't structured to see. Yeah, it's, but, um, yeah, yeah. Hi, thank you so much for, for coming and having this wonderful conversation. I was really captivated by the end of this piece um, when the when we were on the water and the camera was shaking. Mm -hmm. And I'm in relation to what you were talking about of um, like you as the person holding the camera suiting the, the image to the landscape. You know, when you're watching that image, you get like a little bit nauseous mm -hmm. from the shake itself. And I wonder if you can talk about like yeah, just sort of speak more about that but about like suiting yourself and like your own body to the landscape as the person who's even holding the camera. Mm -hmm. um, I don't I don't know I have if I have many intelligent things to say about this other than um, yeah I mean I, I'm I'm interested in uh, the camera movement uh, scale and uh, uh, at that at that level in that that kind of motion and uh, I, I think this is perhaps a, a response to the way these landscapes have been uh, looked at, very aerial, drone, uh, clean kind of uh, photography um, that I, I'm not interested in using and that actually has now spread to many different kinds of uh, image making. I mean, drone footage is very common. Uh, robotic movement that, you know, would not come out of the way you walk or look or... Um, so it's now something that is so common that we think of it as simply professional, you know? Um, so, so for me, it's important to try to uh, use the camera in a, in a way that the uh, error uh, and uh, body is present. Um, I will follow, follow up. Thanks again. Um, that was remarkable. But I guess following from your question, I wanted to ask you about um, about the specificity of, of, of military and military occupation installation, because it seems like there's something 
Um, really crucial in terms of the way you were talking about, um, there's a lot of things, but one maybe anecdote to lead into this, there was some um, with the last major earthquakes in northern Italy, one of the things I was really struck by is the news coverage attempting to sort of depict the consequences of it for those who didn't live there, is they would do this thing, well-intentioned but kind of horrific, where they would have a before and after photo of the exact same location. But the thing that was really striking is the before images they used were basically Google Street images. And there's a way for me in which was quite striking is that in the attempt to make, um, let's say to make rubble, as Gaston Gordillo would, would talk about in the history of um, uh, ex-colonial ruins, to make it not a ruin but like understand the wreckage, what often feels like it happens is that it erases the real specificity of the normal or before image. So in that case, right, these are like Google Street View things that are entirely beholden to legacies, legacies of, of military vision, of mapping, that kind of cartography in sight. And so one of the things I really um, deeply admire in your work is the sense of the labor of, of defamiliarizing sight that is the before, and not just the, the kind of actual before of the hurricane that's come, but the kind of military before that gets naturalized. So that's a long preamble to say, I was hoping you could talk more about what does it mean to be making work uh, I see as like genuine um, kind of a cinema decolonization that takes out the military specificity as the real kind of lived fact rather than one that's more based on other forms of, of kind of colonial power. Yeah. Well, it, it's, I mean, it's, um, there's just a few ways of creating images of, of the Caribbean in general, but of Puerto Rico, of the place where I live, um, that have dominated over the past 100 years. And one of them is the military creating images of this land. And it's, not, it's quite literal. Um, like Ceiba, this place, um, you were, nobody was allowed to go in there, not just to create images, but to see what was happening in there that was not in some ways involved with the military operation. And this was, um, dramatically demonstrated when during the civil disobedience movement um, there was finally a moment in which the Navy invited people that were part of a gubernatorial committee that were going to decide really how much damage had been done and it was made up of the archbishop, um, you know, people associated with the government, etc. And um, they were so shocked when they were able to see the aerial image of the bombing um, that so there's a cameraman that's recording this and actually transmitting it on the news. It was a really important moment. Um, and you can see when the archbishop and the secretary of state start crying when they are looking at this, at this landscape because they they could not have imagined um, what was there. So for 60 years, people really didn't have an image even of what it was that was not uh, a kind of a glorification, uh, more competent towards the 60s, 50s and 60s. That photography was like really uh, beautiful aerial photography, less competent as consumer cameras start uh, popping up. But when you see the history of images produced uh, of these places, and this is not a tiny piece of land, it's the, it was the largest US Navy base outside of a continental US. Um, uh, so you, you can see how much control they had about uh, what images were created, which is also uh, what you can imagine this place can be other than a place to bomb. Um, so that's a, the military uh, image, uh, the, the, the images that the military created were very important in organizing our own imagination of what was possible over the past you know, uh, decades. Other kinds of image production that uh, have been common are related to tourism and service. Um, and those actually have, uh, imitated the image that the military created as well. You find it, you know, many uh, technical and formal uh, strategies that come from that. So, um, so for me, it was seeing this as really the 
a, a way of thinking, a visual, uh, visual form that has uh, so organized us that it's uh, one of the first things that we have to do in order to be able to imagine a different way of, of being in the place. Of being. And, and this has really, um, I mean, I'm uh, you, kind of speaking about it a bit abstractly, but it has real practical consequences um, in terms of uh, who can live there um, and what, as a collective, we can imagine uh, that can, be, can happen in this place. Well, thank you very much. Beatrice, thank you. And, um, thanks for coming. Thanks for coming, everyone.